Hi, I'm Alistair, and this is a video about real-time location systems using ultra-wideband technology, or UWBRTLS. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, it's a positioning system similar to GPS, except that instead of relying on signals from satellites, it uses short distance radio communication between nearby devices like these. So instead of being a global positioning system, it's a local positioning system. And you can use these devices indoors or outdoors, and because they use radio waves, there doesn't need to be a direct line of sight between them. And it's claimed that you can track objects with an accuracy of around 10 centimetres, even through walls. Now, all this sounds pretty great technology, and I've seen some very impressive demonstration videos that gave me lots of ideas of how I could use it. If you take a look at this promotional video, for example, you can see the output in the corner of the screen appears to be accurately calculating the location of a person as they move around the space. And I thought that the ability to track people or objects accurately in 3D space had loads of interesting, playful applications. So I thought I'd give it a try myself. However, having experimented with these units for a little while now, I've discovered that this is not a straightforward, out-of-the-box solution. I was hoping that I'd be able to create this video to demonstrate how to make a kind of drop-in replacement for GPS tracking, where I could update the location of objects in real time on a floor plan map, uh, a bit like an offline Google Maps, and use it to automatically trigger events when people or objects were placed in certain positions. And I'm not saying that you can't do that with this technology, but it's complex. And to make it work, you'll have to put in a whole lot of time into researching and understanding exactly how to configure it. I mean, the data sheet and application notes for these devices goes on for thousands of pages. Now, if you're a multi-million pound company looking to track all the assets in a huge warehouse, that might be worth the investment. But to be honest, I'm not prepared to put the effort into do all that research just for a small project. But I did make some progress in getting there. So in this video, I'll share with you what I've learned along the way, what I tried, and hopefully that will still be of some use to you. So let's start out by looking at how UWB positioning actually works. So you start by placing two or more of these devices at known fixed locations, anywhere you want. And these devices don't move, and so they're called anchors. And they're equivalent to the satellites that are in geostationary orbit around the Earth that are used in GPS system. So you could place anchor devices in the corners of a room, or in different parts of a warehouse, or in a hospital, for example. And then you have uh, other devices that are mobile and move around, and they receive signals from and send replies back to these anchors. And by comparing the length of time that it takes a packet of data to perform a round trip between an anchor and the tag, you can calculate where this device must be. Now, I'm using uh, these li neat little boards, uh, which have got an ultra-wideband chip built in alongside an ESP32, and they're mounted on a handy compact PCB. Uh, the chip they use is a DecaWave DW1000 transceiver, and depending on how you configure it, one of these devices can act as either an anchor or as a tag. So, to locate an object in 3D space, you need to have at least four of these devices. You have three stationary anchors, and then you have your tag that you move around. And all of these devices act a bit like a kind of a permanently scanning radar, listening out for other UWB devices. And once, uh, once when another one comes within range, they start communicating with each other. And we have this process of calculating the time of flight between devices for this uh, sort of challenge response packet of data to be sent between them. Now, when we know the time of flight between two devices, 
we can use that to determine the distance between them. And if you know the distance uh, from three fixed points to the mobile point, you can work out exactly where you are using a process called trilateration. Um, now you might be familiar with triangulation, that's where you know the angles to three fixed points. Well trilateration is very similar except you know the distances to three fixed points. Okay so this whole system relies on the accurate measurement of distance between the tag and a number of anchors. And so uh, these devices came with some sample code that calculates that distance. So I started off by simply uploading that and uh, trying out and seeing if I could measure the distance from the tag to an anchor. Uh, so let me show you how I got on. Okay, so what I've got here is one of these devices that's been configured as an anchor. And I've placed that alongside this meter-long ruler. Now, this ruler is made of metal, so I've deliberately not placed the device on the ruler itself in case the metal interferes with the uh, radio communication pattern of the aerial. But I've just placed it so it's level and lined up with the, the zero mark at one end here. Then I've got uh, another device, and this one has been configured as a tag, so a mobile device that can move around and it's got a little OLED screen attached to it. Now, if I show you what that screen is displaying, it's giving me the hex address of any anchors that have been detected in range, and also a readout of the calculated distance to them in meters. Now, that's gonna be quite hard for you to um, read in this video. So as well as that, what I've got is I've got the serial output from the anchor connected to my laptop and I'm going to display the output from the Arduino serial plotter that is showing the data coming from that. One of the nice things about the way that the infrastructure of a UWB ranging system works is that both the anchor and the tag that is communicating with it, they both have um, an agreed view of the distance calculation between them. So you can retrieve that data either on the tag or on the anchor and it will be the same. Um, so that's kind of quite useful, uh, the, the way that that's been set up. But um, if I move the tag closer to the anchor, you'll be able to see on the graph there that the distance reading goes down. As I move it further away, you'll be able to see that that distance increases and I can kind of quite happily slide the tag up and down the, uh, the ruler here when we get variable distance readings. But in terms of how accurate they are, let's now try placing this at a known location. Let's choose the 50 centimetre mark here. So I'll place um, the tag level with the, the 50 centimetre mark. I don't know exactly what point of the board I'm trying to take these measurements from, so I'm just kind of lining the cables up and that seems like a, a fair enough test. But the reading I'm getting here on the display is around just under 1 metre 40 away. Um, and you should be able to see that on the graph as well. Now that's a long way off the 50 centimetres we would expect. If I slide it closer to, let's say, the 25 centimetres mark, I'm now getting a reading of um, about 94 centimetres. Then as I move it towards this end, up towards 75, let's say, um, I'm now reading over two metres away. And also I'm getting a lot of noise on the signal there has become very jittery. So there's clearly something not quite right with the readings I'm getting here. So I actually repeated this experiment um, with a bunch of different boards and I plotted the results I got. And what I found was that every possible pairing of devices I tried consistently overstated the distance calculated between them. The exact error differed, but it was always around the 50 centimetre mark. So I tried to research possible causes and solutions for this. Was there some sort of setting or configuration or calibration I needed to do? And this is where it started to get really complex. 
As I mentioned in the introduction to this video, the DecaWave website has got some very thorough application notes that go into detail about things like the effects of channel selection, transmit power, antenna delay, crystal oscillator bias, clock drift, but this quickly turns into a minefield and there's nothing like a simple setup guide for beginners. I contacted the manufacturer of the boards I'm using to ask if they could advise of any calibration that was required. I didn't receive a reply, but it seems that other users have experienced the same problem as well. So this was a bit of a roadblock. However, from looking at the graphs, you can see that the gradients of all the lines are approximately correct. It's just that they don't intercept the y-axis at the right point. So I thought I could take a brute force approach of simply calculating the average offset value that each anchor reported and then subtracting that from the distance that they gave. It's kind of hacky and imprecise, but if it let me get approximately correct distance readings from three anchor points, that would be enough for me to continue to develop the next stage of the application, which was to trilaterate those readings to calculate a position. So this is the code that's running on all the devices um, and as I mentioned they're using ESP32 processors so that's the target board I've got selected but I'm writing it in the Arduino IDE just because that's convenient and familiar to many people and also it has those useful tools like the serial plotter which I used to uh, plot the graph of the distances earlier. And this is exactly the same sketch that is running whether the device is operating as a tag or as an anchor. And the vast majority of the code is actually identical for those two devices. There are a few little differences between them. Uh, so the first thing I do at the top of the code here is I've just got two defines. One that says is tag and one that says is anchor. And these are uh, preprocessor directives that, depending on which mode the device uh, is specified here, slightly different sections of code will be incorporated later on. But we'll encounter those when we get to those in a minute. Uh, so then I get onto some includes. So these are external libraries. Um, the connection between the ESP32 and the DW1000 chip is done over an SPI interface. So I'm including the generic SPI interface and also this library here which exposes specific functions of the DW1000. Now I base this on an existing library but I had to make some modifications to actually make it work with the ESP32. So uh, the link here is to my modified version of the library which I'm using. Um, I'm then using an existing library for the OLED display that you can download here. And then this section here is only relevant if the device is operating as a tag. So remember I mentioned that both the tag and the anchor have access to the distance information that's been calculated as a result of the ranging operation. And you could have uh, chosen either one to be responsible for reporting the distance to a server. I'm doing it from the tag. Um, that's a kind of slightly arbitrary decision, I suppose, to be honest. Um, but that one just seemed to make more sense. So the tag is going to uh, interrogate all of the anchors, which it can uh, receive data from in range. It is going to be responsible for keeping track of the distances to each one and the addresses of the anchors it can see. And then it's going to report that wirelessly to a server. So only the tag needs to have some additional libraries in order to do that. It needs to have the Wi-Fi library and also the Wi-Fi UDP library. Now, I've not used this before. Um, so previously, when I've had a, uh, an ESP or an Arduino device communicate data to a PC, I've typically done that either over MQTT or sometimes over HTTP. Well, here I'm opening... A socket connection and I'm just going to stream data over UDP instead um, and that's kind of a very efficient way of uh, transferring a stream of, of data which is what we're going to have here the data is actually going to be packaged up as uh, JSON 
So I'm including the Arduino JSON library as well. So it's going to be semi-structured data um, about the addresses and ranges of all of the anchors that the tag can receive. And the structure is going to be in the form of a linked list. So I've included this uh, link.8 library here. This actually came as part of the, um, the DW1000 ranging library as well, and I decided to keep it because it's, it's quite an efficient structure. If you're familiar with modern programming languages, like C Sharp, for example, you may be used to the idea of using lists to group variables together. So a list is where you have a, a whole bunch of items and you can add new items to it at runtime. You can search the list to see whether it contains an item and update it or remove it. And it's all you know very easy to use. But in slightly more traditional programming languages, what you had instead was an array. And an array is similar, except that you normally have to declare at compile time how many elements it's going to have in it to allow the compiler to uh, assign a block of memory. So if we're going to keep track of the number of anchors in range of the tag, for example, that value is going to change all the time. Um, we might be able to see one or two or three anchors. Maybe we can see 20 or 40. And we have to be able to keep track of this list that's constantly changing in size, how many elements it's it's got. So um, the way that the, the linked list does this, very briefly, um, so you have a structure, and the structure contains uh, information about one particular item in the list. So in this case, we've got the address and the, uh, the range to the anchor that has that address. But it also contains a pointer to the next item in the list as well. So every uh, link, every link in this sort of chain of related values, as well as containing information itself, just has a pointer to whatever the next link is. And this is, um, you know, this is a standard programming structure, but it's actually quite clever when you when you think about it, when you start to use it. And what that means is that you can add more elements onto the end of the list by finding the current last element and then updating where it points to next. When you get to the end of the chain, what you do is you simply have a null value to indicate that this is the last uh, link in the list. You can also uh, delete links from the middle of the list by finding the link that pointed to this element and repointing it instead to whatever the next one is. So you kind of take an, imagine like a chain of values and you've pulled a link out the middle. What you do is you fasten the preceding link to the one that comes next instead. So it's, um, you know, like I say, this is actually a standard programming structure, but this is kind of a, a nice, neat implementation of it. So I've kept that in there and we're going to use that as the structure that keeps track of the anchors that the tag knows about in range. Okay, so then we go on to the constants. Um, so every device in the network needs to have a unique uh, address associated with it so that uh, other devices can uh, address it. Um, and um, I did a little bit of research into this and I found out that there is a standard for assigning uh, local device addresses that always begins at zero, 02. Um, so what I've done is that all of my anchors are going to be given an address that is 0, 02, then a load of zeros, and then I've just called them 1, 2, 3, 4, up to however many anchors um, you're going to use in the system. And then obviously also remember that for an anchor you want to have uh, this bit uncommented and that bit commented out. And then for my tags, what I've done is I've just set a uh, this value up here to 1, and then my first tag will be 1001 or 2, 3, 4, etc. I mean, you can use uh, any system you want, just so long as every uh, device has a unique address, that's all. Um, and we're not going to be communicating outside of uh, the network at all here, so um, there should be absolutely no risk of collisions with other devices at all. Um, that's the point of, of using this uh, value at the beginning here, so we're saying it's effectively a local only network. Um, 
Then we have some more values which are only relevant to the tag because these relate to the Wi-Fi connection which is what it's going to use to send the uh, the data values to the server which is going to, to plot the results um, uh, you know, in an application. Um, so we've got the connection details to connect to the local Wi-Fi network. Uh, this is going to be the IP address of the host PC um, which is going to be running a, a Unity application. I mean you could uh, you know, run anything you want here. This could be running Python or Java or something that's going to receive the range data from the tag and it's going to do something with it. Um, like I say, I'm using Unity and I'll show you that uh, application in a moment. And the, the port that is going to be open on that server uh, to receive this uh, UDP connection data. Okay. And then we go to globals, so we'll just initialize the OLED display. This is totally optional, um, but it is quite useful to be able to see uh, the values on the device itself. Saves you kind of having to plug in a, a USB cable all the time to read the serial output um, you know, on the computer if you can actually read data on the device itself. So it's just those OLED displays are not very expensive at all, and they're, they're pretty convenient to have. Um, connected directly to the device. Uh, that uses a, an I squared C interface um, so just passing the value minus one here will just use all the default I squared C pins on the device. Uh, again we've got some information that's only relevant to the tag because this is all about setting up the um, the Wi-Fi connection. We'll initialize our linked list. Uh, we'll just say how often we're going to send updates to the server so I'm going to send them uh, every 0.2 of a second and this is um, uh, to keep track of when we last sent any data. Uh, okay then we get on to a setup function so setup um, begin a serial connection just regular here print the file name and the date of this uh, sketch here initialize the SPI interface these are the pins on the ESP um, board which I'm using, which are the default uh, SPI pins. I believe I'm right in saying that the ESP actually lets you remap uh, any any pins possibly. I'm not sure if it's any pins or whether there's just certain pins uh, for multiple SPI interfaces, but these were the default on the board which I'm using anyway. So this is um, system clock, uh, master in, slave out, and master out, slave in. And then we're going to uh, initialize the um, the DW1000 chip itself. So we've got some more pins here. This is a reset, this is the chip select pin, and this is the uh, interrupt pin. And we're going to, so it uses an event driven model for the DW1000. So when something happens, um, we're going to define some different methods to call. And the something happens that we want to know about, well, have we moved relative to an anchor point that we already know about? Um, that's going to call the new range handler when that happens. Have we discovered a new anchor that we didn't even know existed before on the network? Well, that's going to call new device. Or has uh, an anchor that we previously knew about and had a connection to, has that moved out of range? In that case, we're going to call inactive device. So we define uh, three event handlers based on three different events that happen. This is just initializing the OLED display if you're using one. And now this is where we get to define uh, a little bit about the mode that the UWB chip is going to operate in. So you'll notice I've got a section here for the anchor and a section here for the tag and they need to be operating in the same mode to be able to communicate. So whatever value you change list to here, you do need to make sure that you uh, choose a matching value here. The only difference is you'll notice this one calls start as anchor and this one calls start as tag. But the important thing is they need to be operating at the same uh, data rate, they need to have the same um, style of preamble of message and things like that as well. And there are some different built-in um, modes that come with the library. Now, I tried a variety of these um, yeah, <laughs> to try to improve the range and reception and the accuracy I got. And I'll be totally honest, I was not convinced that they were actually doing what they said they were going to do. We've got one that says that it's low power 
Uh, we've got one that says that it's accurate. We've got one that says that it's fast. We've got one that says it's range. And, I, you know, I was struggling to actually see the effects that these had. Um, so what I've done is I've, I've the one I've chosen here supposedly has um, range and accuracy. Well, that sounds like a good combination. The disadvantage is it's not going to be operating in low power, but I'm willing for that to be a trade-off at the moment uh, if I could improve the accuracy or the range. And the truth is I didn't seem to really do either, so I'm not quite sure if I totally understand the effects of these different modes. Um, the accuracy I'll, I'll show you in, in a moment when I actually get the, the application running. The real problem here I was having was with the range because I could not get a tag and an anchor to detect more than about three meters away from each other at max. And at that distance, the accuracy really started to struggle as well. You saw that uh, in the video when I was uh, showing you the range between the devices as well. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to accept there's a trade-off between range and accuracy, but I couldn't really seem to get either working correctly. So um, that for me was a, another kind of complete stumbling block which uh, made me unsatisfied with this project but you know i've left it in there if you want to try these different modes go nuts um the main thing is this one and this one need to match the anchors and the tags do need to be operating with the same uh, agreed mode that's the main thing um print on the oled display what mode this particular device is operating in and then uh, what we'll do, so we're in the tag section at the moment. So the tag initializes the Wi-Fi connection. It says the IP address it's on. It opens the port uh, for the UDP interface. And it also calculates what I'm calling a short address. So I've mentioned that every device on the network needs to have a unique, um, a unique address, a bit like a MAC address, but that's actually quite long. I think it was, was it 48 bytes? I can't quite remember. Um, that's going to be quite inconvenient to have to display that on the screen each time. So we'll also have a short address which is just formed from these last four uh, bytes at the end. Um, uh, so that's what the short address is down here. Uh, yes, so we'll just take the uh, the final two bytes there. Two bytes, sorry, did I say four bytes? Two bytes. Uh, and we'll just express them there. Okay. Nearly there. So now we go into the loop. The loop is thankfully uh, pretty short because we simply call the loop method of the DW1000 ranging library. And what that does is that will listen out for those. Remember, I said it was an event driven um, sort of system. So it listens out for these events. And if any of them need to be called, it will call the appropriate handler there for us. So you don't need to manually call that. All you need to do is make sure that you call this on every iteration of loop. And then for the tag specifically, what we'll do is we'll send those update uh, messages to the server with the uh, packets of, of data that represent the linked list of all of the um, anchors that are detected at the time. So if the current timestamp, uh, the, if the difference between the current timestamp and the time we last updated the server is greater than the update interval, which I defined at the top of the code as I think it was 200 milliseconds. Uh, yeah. So if, if more than 200 milliseconds has elapsed since the last time we told the server something, let's send it uh, the current data set instead, and we'll just update the time we last sent it. This is a very, very common kind of uh, pattern of, of data here when you want to update something regularly. Uh, and we call this send JSON message, um, which is what we define below. So I'm using the JSON library. Um, there's lots of great information about that. It's a really, really good library, actually, the Arduino JSON library. Um, if you do need to send structured data from an Arduino or an ESP, for that matter, or any other chip, um, rather than just streaming text data over serial connection if you want to do it in a structured format like json this is a really really good library to do it um, so uh, what i'm doing is i'm creating a new json document i'll create a uh, uh, the high 
level element called ID, which I'll set to the short address of this device. Remember I said it's more convenient to refer to the short address formed just from the last two bytes rather than the whole thing. And then what we're going to do is we're going to loop over all the elements in our linked list. We're going to create a nested object and that's going to contain um, the addresses and the range of all of the anchors that the tag currently knows about. Okay, um, so the end result uh, of this, the, the, the end, sort of what this JSON array looks like um, when it's sent to the server every 200 milliseconds is basically like this. And we're going to pass that out at the other end on the server and we're going to use that to update our application. Um, we'll send it to the serial connection as well, just because we may as well. And then we will send it over a, a socket connection um, using UDP as well. Um, so that's nice and straightforward. Then we get to the callback handlers. So these are the things that we actually um, assigned right at the top of the code. And these are the things that the loop function will check each iteration of the loop and see whether to call them or not. New range is when we um, ha have want to update the distance to a known anchor. Um, so this bit here simply displays on the OLED. Um, so where I was showing you the code earlier, where I was moving the tag up and down the ruler, um, closer to and farther away from the anchor, and I was showing you the distance calculation, this code here is what was doing that. Uh, it's just displaying on the OLED screen uh, formatted distance from um, a particular anchor device. And we'll call that update link function to update our linked list as well. New device is what is called when a new anchor has been detected on the network and we'll add it into our linked list. And inactive device is when a previously known anchor, um, we can no longer establish communication with it. And when that happens, uh, we delete it from our linked list. Uh, there you go. That's the code that is running on all of the devices. Okay, so this is the Unity application. So this is running on a PC on the same local area network that the ESP tag is going to connect to over Wi-Fi. And it is going to receive uh, those packets of data, the JSON encoded uh, string representing the distances to all of the anchors that the tag detects. Now, um, the reason I've done it in Unity, well, there's a couple of reasons. And um, the first is that it's just an environment that I'm familiar with and I find it quick to develop in. Uh, another one is that it is very easy to create a nice visual uh, interface. So, um, and in fact, to design things in a visual interface as well. So the cubes I've got in the scene here, this represents the location of the anchors in my system. And you can, arrange them in the scene you can literally drag them around to correspond to their locations in real world space and you're going to need to do that to make the calculations correct for where the tag is um, so you can see the coordinate values here i've got uh, an x and a z um, are the the two uh, coordinate axes I'm using here and you know if, if so if you're positioning them in the in the corners of a rectangular room for example you might have them all aligned like that in an L shape but this particular example I'm going to do in a moment they're actually not quite arranged like that this one is a little bit higher up and this one is slightly further to the left as well they can be anywhere you want and you can actually match these coordinate values to real world distances that you've calculated uh, so that these appear in the correct virtual position corresponding to their real world position um, and I just think that's you know unity makes that really easy to just do that uh, the tag itself is this little red sphere here and I've added uh, a component called a trail render onto the end of it that means that it's going to uh, keep track of its uh, previous known positions as it moves around I don't need to do any kind of complicated code to uh, to keep an array of previous values or something that's just going to plot that for me as well. So that just makes it convenient to to uh, sort of check these things. Uh, in terms of the actual code that's running here, um, so let me have a look. So it's attached to my main camera script and there's two main scripts here. I've got the UDP connection manager and the positioning script as well. So let me just uh, show you what those do. 
Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so one of the uh, more complicated things, about, I suppose, about this is that Unity applications by default run on a single thread. So um, what we want our server to do is to constantly be listening for new packets of data that have been received from the tag and to update the location of the, um, the little red sphere here to correspond to it. But we don't want to be doing that and locking up the rest of the application while it does that. It's a little bit like if you've got an Arduino sketch and you're trying to make an LED blink on and off and you insert uh, delays to make it do that. That kind of causes your whole code to lock up while it's doing that delay. So one of the, the slightly more complicated bits of this code, I suppose, is that I'm running a background thread and that's going to be running the uh, the UDP server code on it to listen to incoming messages so that the main thread can carry on uh, running as normal. We don't kind of get it slowed down while data is received. So if you've not used threads before, that's a, a little bit um, perhaps more complicated than normal, but really it's not too hard. Um, we're going to just declare a thread called receive thread. And um, what we're going to do is to assign the listen for messages uh, on the UDP client here, which we define as a new UDP client on the receive port. The receive port is 50,000, which is what we uh, said in ESP32 code as well. We'll say it's okay for that thread to run in the background and uh, we start it off in start connection and I think start connection is, is called when the, um, the program first starts. So what this does is this basically creates a, an infinite loop while the thread is running but it's an infinite loop on a background thread so that's okay uh, we're not clogging up the, the main thread which is actually running the rest of the application here. Um, we'll accept incoming uh, socket connections from any endpoint, uh, any client basically can connect. And what we'll do is we'll receive any bytes that are uh, available to, to read. Um, we will put them into a queue here because, now this is the other thing, you can't access, uh, you can't access values that have been changed from the background thread directly from the main thread. We're going to place them in a queue and then we're going to process those messages back on the main thread um, by dequeuing items from here. Uh, I guess that's a little bit complicated um, if you've not used threads before but again this is kind of a standard programming um, pattern I suppose so don't worry too much about the complexity here to be honest. I've actually included a send message as well. Um, I base this code on an example which I put a link to up here um, and that includes a, a send message as well. I never use it because I never do outgoing messages from Unity to the ESP32 but I thought I'd include it there just for completeness in case I ever needed to add that uh, functionality as well. So all the code here this is just concerned with running a so opening a socket um, uh, 50,000 is, is the port number and it's going to place any data that the ESP32 tag sends uh, into this queue here and then what we're going to do is we're going to be able to um, de-queue uh, the messages that are there in the update of uh, so we're now we're backing on the main thread again here this one's running on the background thread this one's running on the main thread and what we can do is we can loop through each of the messages that have been received via the connection and then we are going to remember i said that they're encoded as json so we're going to decode the json and we're going to pass them to the positioning script so i've got that here so all of that code so far, that's just about receiving the data. Now we need to do something with that data, okay? So the positioning script, if I show you here, you'll see that it has uh, tags, ranges, and anchors. And the anchors are the uh, anchor A, anchor B, and anchor C, which we've defined in the scene. And as I said, if you move those to a new location in the scene, that location is going to be available to the positioning script here so it will know in virtual space where all of the anchors are located and that's going to be used when it then calculates where the tag is. So you have references to all the anchors 
we have a set of three ranges to all of the anchors as well and we've got some little classes here which we will use to um, pass the JSON data into. This here is the kind of the meaty bit of code I suppose um, and I've included a link to the Wikipedia article which this is based as well. It's all right, I have checked it from other sources as well. So if anyone's about there going, oh, you shouldn't trust Wikipedia, it's fine. This is mathematically correct. And if this is the standard formula for trilaterating a position from three distances to known points. The problem is, as I demonstrated earlier the first thing we have to do is to make some adjustments to those values because we are not getting accurate range measurements so the anchor that had the address um, you know 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 in my previous code that I just showed in the ESP so that's my first anchor consistently read values that were 45 centimeters too high so if I'm getting a, uh, a reading from that anchor, I'm going to deduct 0.45 from whatever it said the distance was. My anchor 2, with the address 0002, was consistently 60 centimetres too high, so I'm going to take 0.6 off. And my anchor with the address 3 was consistently 35 too high, approximately. So I've taken that out. So that is the, um, like I say, the very simplistic brute force calibration adjustment I had to make to try to get these values to work. Once I've done that, uh, you can uh, calculate. So first of all, we use the locations that the anchors have been defined in, in the screen space here. We work out the displacement between them, and then we can work out the x, y, and z value uh, of the tag itself. I explicitly said z to zero because all my anchors are actually at the same height as each other anyway. Um, so I'm not really considering z space in this particular uh, formulation here. And finally, we can return the vector three, so the coordinate position that the tag must be in. You can read all about this uh, formula if you really want to um, at the Wikipedia article here. Once we've um, updated that for each of the tags, we can actually assign the position of the tag in the screen space based on that calculation here. Um, oh, and the decode JSON update, sorry, I haven't mentioned that one. So that was actually looping over the, the JSON. Unity has something called JSON utility built into it. Um, this is another reason for, for using that as a structured data source. It saves me having to pass serial data manually um, because it will just let me loop over it uh, very conveniently and we checked the ID of the tag, which this data package was received from. I've only been trying out tracking one tag so far, but in theory we could track multiple tags using this system and multiple anchors as well. And then what we do is we read the ID um, of the anchors that it could read. And remember the anchors I've got, because I called the addresses one, two, and three corresponding to A, B, and C, we can simply uh, say if the anchor address was one, then it's the first element. If it was two, it's the second one. And if it's three, it's the third one. So that just updates these three elements uh, here. The, the ranges associated with these three elements, sorry, come in here. Um, and that's mostly it. That's kind of a very brief rush through job. Like I say, this code has not been tidied up at all um, because I didn't see much point in doing so. Um, and you'll find out why because the actual, <laughs> the usefulness is not that used. But let me, let me show you in action now. So um, I'm going to move these anchors to the correct position. I'm going to lay out the uh, anchors on my table and tag and we'll give it a try in real life. So I've got my three anchors uh, A, B and C and then I've got my tag which if I now bring into shot and place in the middle you'll see that the Unity application is running and as I move the tag around the space uh, the little uh, labelled red sphere there We'll move around the virtual space, copying the location in real-world space. 
Um, now you'll see it's a oh, it's a bit of a jerk there as well. Um, so it's being updated five times a second, and it is a bit jerky, but it's not too bad. The line renderer actually really helps to smooth out the movement. If I try and make a sort of a smooth circular movement like this, um, you'll see that actually that line renderer kind of hides all oh, some of the jaggedness. There was a bit of a, a bump there. If I just try and go left and right to the full extent uh, of the, the space here, and then I'll just try and go up and down as well, just so you can see that moving there. Um, and there we go. Okay, so here's the thing. I'm going to let you into a secret. That last video segment you watched was a genuine video I recorded relatively early on in my experiments into using these boards. And at that time, I was quite impressed by them and quite hopeful that I was going to find a practical project I'd be able to use them in. However, in the time since recording that, I don't know what I've done, but I have not been able to replicate those results again, either in terms of range or accuracy or precision. Um, and I have tried tweaking all sorts of register values and setting up software and hardware in different ways. And to be honest, everything I've done has actually made it worse, if anything. Um, so for example, I, I mentioned that the anchors were consistently reporting range values that were too high. And I, I showed you that offset in the code, but that offset was changing every time I set up the system. So whereas anchor A used to be 35 centimeters out, it became 70 centimeters out the next time or, or something different from that. And that just makes it completely unusable in a practical sense. Um, the greatest range I was able to get away between the anchor and the tag, um, I couldn't get higher than about 85 centimetres away before I was actually dropping the connection between them. Now, I don't know, this may well be something that I've done. In my attempts to improve performance, I've actually made it significantly worse. If I'm totally honest, I have exhausted my uh, understanding of these boards and I'm perfectly prepared to admit that I'm now out of my depth. But the good news is that the board design themselves uh, and the software that's running on them is open source and the code which I've demonstrated in this video and the Unity project, I will put those over on my GitHub account. So if you want to continue experimenting with these to pick up where I left off and, and hopefully get a bit further than I did, um, I'd be delighted if you want to do that and, and do let me know if you make any more progress than I was able to. Hopefully you've still found this video useful perhaps in other ways as well. I've been able to demonstrate some other examples of using ESP, uh, Wi-Fi, UDP links and Arduino JSON and things like that. So hopefully it's still been useful. Or maybe if nothing else it's told you that these boards are not going to be a simple uh, drop-in solution for local positioning. So if that's what you were hoping for, maybe I've been able to save you some time and a bit of money. Uh, if you've got any questions about them or comments, um, you can still write them and I would do my best to answer them to the best of my ability below, but uh, know that that might be a limited response. Otherwise, uh, hopefully in my next video, I'll be able to show you something a little bit more practical and easy to follow. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in that one next time. Okay, thanks for watching. Bye.